is another day closer to it. So guide us, Father, by thy wisdom. Give us a hope that only rests in thee. For we can plead only the blood and the righteousness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray and amen. <coughs> Turn, if you will, to the <clears throat> book of Psalms. The 23rd Psalm. I think this says what I feel like this morning, and that's what's important. Sometimes we let, we let familiarity with the text steer us away from it and say, well, everybody knows that. That's not true. That's not true. I heard a lot of sermons preached for a lot of years that I didn't understand. I thought I did, but I didn't. But this says, I think, how I feel. I truly, too, feel that the Lord's coming is not. I think if you look carefully around, you can see the evidence some of the Armenian assemblies around us at their condition that it's nigh. Uh, some of the things that are happening in this area, in the churches in this area that we once thought were the strongholds of faith are very rapidly disintegrating into nothing. And they're going back from whence they came. You cannot make a foundation for a church to be gospel regeneration. You just can't do it. That's the bedrock, is that God saves his people. Amen. And him alone. <laughs> and there's nothing between or nothing intervenes between God and that sinner. That's a transaction that takes place between God. He said the wind blows where it pleases. Thou hearest the sound thereof, but you can't tell from whence it comes nor whence it goes. And so the north wind blows sometimes. The cold, bitter north wind blows. But then at times the south wind blows, and we can't control that. We have to wait upon him. Said his eye is on the sparrow. I can see a sparrow that falls beside the road. Or I can see a sparrow that falls in my yard. But he further said, he beholds the sparrow when it falls. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I can't observe the sparrow that falls back in the bush someplace. But he can. Amen. And then he said, of how much more precious are you than those things? Well, this says, I think, what I want to say to you. If you'll notice, first of all, where the 23rd Psalm sits. Look at Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You immediately recognize that as the cross, don't you? And those are the ones that come into Psalm 23. I'm not convinced that every child of God comes into Psalm 23. For you see, many say you have to have faith to go to glory. Well, in regeneration, there's faith. There's an element of faith in regeneration. For he said the fruit of the Spirit works faith, and that comes in regeneration. But that's not what puts you in heaven. The gospel don't put you in heaven. It tells you about it, informs you about it, but it don't put you in heaven. Faith don't put you in heaven. It don't put you in heaven. Repentance don't put you in heaven.
what put you there is the fact that God put you in Christ before the foundation of the world. That'll put you in heaven. But then in this timely walk, we see the cross in Psalm 22. And if you look at Psalm 24, and we read especially verse 3, I think you'll recognize verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? There you see the other end of it. So Psalm 23 stands between the cross and the resurrection. Now I'm not going to hand you much this morning. We'll take it away from you. Psalm 23, David was talking about the work of the shepherd. And he didn't mention your works any place in there, no mind. Amen. It's not to be found. So I'm not going to tell you this morning what you've done. I'll just say this, you haven't done anything. Amen. For in the flesh dwelleth no good thing. And it means just that. The flesh profits nothing. Just that. We have this treasure in an earthen vessel. And it's a treasure in an earthen vessel. And God said to Adam, Dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. And that's where we're all headed. As I look around, I see the evidence of it. But there's another man inside that's not under that curse. He said, The Lord is my shepherd. Here's your earthly journey. Let me, this is simple, but let me read it like someone read it once. The Lord is my shepherd. 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 Each one discernment within itself, each word. We have shepherds, brethren, disciples, Friends. He said, henceforth I call you friends. And then there's disciples. And then there's brethren. And Christ is the firstborn among many brethren. He's one of them. He said, for they who are sanctified... For him who sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one. For this cause, he's not ashamed to call them brethren. And that goes way back. Amen. That goes as far back as the edict of predestination. It goes as far back as that mandate goes. They're all of one. But he's the firstborn among many brethren. We see the Lord as a shepherd. I'd say he's a good shepherd. He's a great shepherd. A lot of men are great men, but they're not good men. A lot of men are good men, but they're not great men. But Christ was the only man that was both great and good. And we're here to prove that because we're here. He said, I shall not want. Oh, how we look at things. I shall not want. That means spiritually, I don't know the thing that we like. April 20th, I think we come into everything that we need to be a body of Christ. And certainly, his fullness fills this place. Now he said in verse 2, he maketh me. Somebody said the Lord won't make you. I disagree. That verse said he makes me. <laughs> he can't do that. He won't interfere with your free will. But first point, you don't have a free will because that's not found no place in the Scripture. I see, Adam had a free will, and Adam didn't have a free will either. <laughs> he didn't have any free will. <laughs> he makes me. 
But then you know sometimes in that he makes me as like the prodigal. He said in this verse, you a minute ago, he said he leads us in paths of righteousness. Sometimes he does that. For you see the darkness and the light are all alike unto God. There's no difference. No difference at all. When we were in sin, he still saw us. Just the same. That old prodigal went out and after he'd squandered everything he had, he started back across the way. And when he got back, and be mindful that the father saw him coming. He saw him. He knew where he was. Knew where he was all the time. But he was preparing him for something. And the prodigal, that, that boy didn't understand it. When he got back, he said, Lord, he said, if you'll just make me, make me one of your hired servants. He was willing to take his place the lowest place in the assembly. He said, if you'll just give me that place, he said, I'll be happy. Make me. He said, he makes me to lie down. Don't say the Lord won't make you. He will make you. Either make you or he'll draw you by cords of love. He'll do it either way. He pleases. And if he decides to make you to lie down, he'll do just exactly that. And I'll tell you what. And you'll be glad, and you'll be happy, and you'll be willing to do it when he gets through. For he has a way about him like that. Now he said he makes me to lie down. We lie down. What does that suggest to you? That's strange advice. Now I want you to notice now what we're seeing. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down. Who makes you to lie down? Do you do it by your free will? Do you do it by your study? Do you do it because you're a good fellow? That word is prefaced there and the foundation of it is he makes. He makes me to do what? Lie down. That's strange advice, isn't it? To lie down. In this day and time, everybody says, be up and about. One fellow said not so long ago, he said, if everybody in the church, he said, if we don't get busy, and get to knocking on doors. And he said, you know, he said, this church is going to fold. Well, let me say, that's just exactly what's wrong with that kind of assembly. They're knocking on too many doors, and they need to step back and let the Holy Spirit knock on a few doors, and they need to let him do a little bit of guidance. He said, lie down. That means to be totally inactive. Lie down. The problem is today that men want to be involved in the regeneration of souls, which they don't have anything to do with, and they don't realize they need to lie down and let God handle his business. Lie down. That means inactivity. We see the virgins. Take a look at those virgins for a minute. That was the problem with the five wise and five foolish. All of them had eternal life. All of them experienced that. As so aptly pointed out, they had heard the voice of the bridegroom. But take a look. There was five that was wise. And they knew, and they were concerned about God and the things of God. They were concerned about God's beings and they were wise. Five were foolish. What were those foolish doing? They was coming before God in their works and in their effort. And that door that they knocked on was shut was the door of the marriage. And that's all. It was not a door of salvation, as some have said. It was a door of the marriage. They were presenting themselves to God in their works, in their labors, in their efforts. And God said, I cannot hear you. And neither will we when we present ourselves in that manner. He come to the woman at the well. And he said, if you drink of this water, you're going to thirst again. And we did for so many years. We drank of that water and we drank again and drank again and drank again. And you'll never get satisfied in that water. But he said, if you take a drink of the water that I give you, he said, you'll never thirst again. And so there's a difference in that water. He said to a lady that she would went around and said she would went to every physician that there was. Now he was not talking about some woman that was going to a doctor. That wasn't what he was talking about. He wasn't talking about some woman that kept going to the doctor every day because she had a blood disease. That wasn't what he was talking about. He said she had a disease of the blood and she would went to every doctor that she went to. That's not what he's talking about. Quite plainly what he was talking about was someone 
that it went to a law preacher, a law preacher, and he, she listened over and over and over again, and she was never satisfied. You know what? I knew years ago, and you did, and you did, for we've talked about it, and you did, for we've talked about it many times. We knew that there was something else. We knew there was something else. And that woman, you know what was happening to her? God was preparing her that he might bring her to a proper place. And then finally she said she spent all that she had. And when she spent all that she had, there she stood. God had blessed her with faith and regeneration. She was a born-again, heaven-born, quickened sinner. She was searching and looking for something. And when she come to the place, she said, Lord, I've done all that I can do. And then you know what? And finally she said, there's Jesus. Now listen what she said. She didn't say, I'll go running up to him and say, Lord, I'm here. Like they presented in this day and time, you know, somebody comes running today. And those Armenian free willers, oh, they get so happy. For everybody that comes a running, they're just sure that's one of God's, uh, God's people, you know. Do you know what that woman said? Oh, she said, if I can just get close enough. Now watch. She said, if I can just get close enough to touch the hem of his garment. She didn't go running up in his face and say, Lord, I'm here. She said, if I could just but touch the hem. No. Humble. Brought by grace. Prepared by grace. He was working the whole thing. He was the one that worked in her that desire. And he brought her to that place. And she lay in the dust and said, If I can just but touch the hem. And among that crowd and that multitude, she touched the hem of his garment. And he turned and he said, Somebody touched me. He said, Lord, there's people all around. How can you say that? He said, virtue is going out of me. Now, how did Peter say it? Peter said, according as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness and all of that, there's your eternal life. And then the very next verse says, add to your faith virtue. And Jesus said, virtue is going out of me. She was adding to her faith and her virtue was going out of him. And he turned and he looked and he recognized. And she said, she stepped back, humbly back and said, I don't need to be seen. She said, if I can just but touch the hem of his garment, isn't that quite different than those who stand today and say, they think that they're going to go yonder through the halls of glory and they're going to shout all over the streets of glory. They say, they know nothing about that place up there. They have no vision of it. They know nothing about the lowly Christ or the kingly Christ. They know nothing about either one. Make me to lie down. They say, you people are lazy. You don't believe in missions. You don't believe in the salvation of souls. They say, you don't believe in preaching the gospel. Well, that is the gospel. <laughs> and I'll tell you this. We're more busier about God's business than they know anything about. Amen. When the prodigal got home and the Lord said, the father said, put some shoes on his feet. You know what the other boy said? Now, he was a son. You know what he said? He said, Father said, you never killed no calf for me. You never put any shoes on my feet. You never gave me any ring. He was a son. There was two sons there. Is that what they say today? You never done that for me, Lord. He said, you've always been with me. And he never will put those shoes on that fellow's feet. He never will put a ring on his finger, and he'll never put a robe on him. And that's where they are today. I'd rather take the path of the prodigal. For it said he leads us in paths of righteousness 
and we don't understand that fully. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. A couple of weeks ago, I preached on give not that which is holy unto the dogs. You know what? You put a dog out in green pastures, they'd starve to death. You put a sheep out there and they'd get fat. You take the sheep and put him over and eat dog food and he'll starve to death. But he puts it in green pastures, not dry, barren, but green pastures. The Lord's trees are green. They're evergreen. He puts us in green pastures. More to that in a minute. He leads me beside the still waters. He leads me beside... Notice again, who leads you? He leads me. Notice, I want you to notice how many times he is referred to in this. He leads me. Do you lead yourself? Do you study and say, here's what I'm going to do? Is it of you? I'm saying, I'm not going to give us anything this morning in the flesh whatsoever. He leads us beside the still waters. Not raging, turbulent waters, but still waters. Can you have peace? Yes, you can. Can you lay down at night and say he leads beside the still waters? Yes, you can. I believe those waters can be referenced to many things. David said in one of the Psalms someplace, Psalm 46, he said it like this. He said, there is a river. There is a river. And he said, the streams thereof make glad the city of God. You want to know where the city of God is this morning? It's right here. He said, that city, that river that flows. John said, I saw a pure river flowing from underneath the throne of God. That's the sovereignty of God and of the Lamb. John said it was a pure river, and that's a river of God's eternal everlasting grace that flows to lost damned sinners. That's exactly what that is. And it flows, that means that it's active and it's moving. He said he saw a river, David did. And he said the streams, oh, there's many streams to it. Divine election, absolute predestination. All of these things are some of the streams that flows. But every one of them flows with grace and not merit and not works. Every one of them is the grace of an eternal God. And it makes glad the city of God. He leads me. Free will leads you. You know that word's not even in the Bible. You can't find free will in there. Many say today, free moral agency. You can't find free moral agency in the scriptures. It's not there. It's not there. The only thing you'll find there is the everlasting love of God. I believe in free grace. Amen. He leads me beside. Now watch. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Well, you say back there when I was, that's not what he's talking about. Israel said one time, said they were hungry and thirsty and they fainted within. Let me say it in plain. I believe sometimes the Lord restores my soul every day. Sometimes I think every five minutes. He restores, what now? He restores my soul. He restores. Who leads you? He leads you beside the still waters. He makes you to lie down. Where are you in this? This is the work of the shepherd among his sheep. I don't see free will. I don't believe free will. From right here to the bottom of my foot, I hate and despise everything that free will is, and yet I'm a man made under Adam, made under law, and I've got enough of it. Like I said, we can say sometimes, that's free will, and that's Armenian, and that's Armenian, and that's Armenian, but I've got some of it in me too. And I want it out. But it won't be out till I lay this body down and take up that new body and then it'll be gone. He restoreth my soul. And that's a frequent experience. Who does it? Can you pray for it? I read a letter this week and a fellow said, if you just follow the prescribed means that Jesus laid down. You know when people talk about Jesus like that, I doubt if they know him. Mm -hmm. 
He said, if you'll just follow the prescribed means that Jesus laid down, he said, you can have happiness and joy, and you can have all these things if you'll just follow the prescribed means. Brother, that is nothing but W-O-R-K-S. We wait on him. I sat back there before the service started, and I said, Lord, we desire your presence more than anything else. It's not what I say that amounts to a hill of beans. It's what he says. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. No matter what it might be, he was leading you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And he worked it out. He said the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And I believe that refers to Christ, but I say it also refers to the seed of Christ. And let me say it like this. If the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, let me ask you a question. Who can prevent that man from walking in those steps if God so divinely ordered it? None can. Man cannot do it, for God ordered that. And if that's ordered of him, then it must be so. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Notice, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I believe in Jesus Christ, dwell of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And I believe God turned everything over to Christ. He's the head of the body. And when that body was formed back there, in, in before the foundation of the world, so was the body formed. Formed then in God, filled Christ with all with, with all the fullness of that Godhead and everything today flows from him. There's not an event in this life that takes place but what not comes out of Christ and was so decreed to be. There does not need to be any new decrees offered. They don't need to be for it was all covered there before the foundation of this world. And so now it just comes to pass day by day. Things visible that you can see or things invisible that you can't see. It's all predestinated to be. I don't believe. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You ever walk there? You ever walk there? Why, well, sure. Sure you walk there. We walk there every day. But it's a valley. And he said the shadow of death. Yea, though I walk through the valley, thou art with me. Have you ever thought that you were just so depressed? Paul said one time that he despaired even of life. Have you ever been like that? One time I thought I was losing my mind. I was sitting and I was watching some birds and I thought, Lord, I'd rather you'd let me be born in this life a bird. I'd have been better off and the way I am. And I thought I was crazy. I thought you're losing your mind. And I was reading the other night after an old saint of old, and he said many had been the times that he wished that God had brought him into the world and let him have been like a, a bird or an animal, and he could have just died and forgot about it and would have had all the problems. So I wasn't, I didn't feel so crazy then. You know? You know? Yea, though I walk, but watch what it says. Yea, though I walk through the valley. See what it says? Yea, though I walk through the valley. Through the valley. Thou art with me. And I don't like these necks, but they're there. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I don't like the rod. But oh, I'm thankful when it comes. For it comforts me in the fact that I know I'm a child of God when the rod comes. I don't like the rod. And I, I dearly don't want to see anybody come under the rod. For I'll tell you this. That's the most miserable little man can be. Under the rod. And thy staff, they comfort me. That keeps me from errors and keeps me in the way. Now then he said, now notice now. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Can you associate that? You have any trouble with that verse? Thou preparest a table before me. What's he saying there? In the presence of mine enemies. Isn't that so? 
Who are the enemies? Well, most of them is not the world, as we say. Most of them is the religious world, so-called. Thou preparest a table. The Lord has a place for us to eat. And he serves his dinner by courses. He serves a course and another course. If he had served the absolute predestination in the manner that we see it today, back 30 years ago, it probably would have choked me to death. I told a fellow one time that come to me, we was talking about salvation of sinners, and he got to tell me about how they sowed the seed in the ground, and so we got to talking, and I said, well, wait a minute now. I said, that ground, that ground is prepared before the seed sows into it. And he said, yeah. I said, well, tell me something. Who prepares that ground? And he stood a minute, and he looked at me, and he was in a corner, and he said, the seed does. He said, the seed prepares the ground. I told him, and I pointed a finger to him, and I got real close. I said, I want to tell you something. If God ever shows you how that he saves a sinner, how that God quickens from heaven a newborn sinner and gives life without the aid of the gospel or gospel preacher, I said, son, you'll choke to death and you'll die right on the spot. A man that would, would tell me that seed sows the ground, but he worked himself in a corner and there wasn't nothing else he could say. You know what? Thou prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. I see the work today as being completed before the foundation of the world. It was all done then. It all passed before the mind of God in that time and in that hour. And it's all done. Grace is completed. The works are done. And nothing else needs to be done. Christ did it. And alone. And he did it all. He said, my father worked hitherto. And now I work. And he said on the cross, he said, it's finished. And he prepares that table before us. Absolutely predestination of all things. Yes, it is. I form the light. I create darkness. He did both. He said his hand has formed the crooked serpent. Yes he did. His hand formed even the devil. He said the wrath of men shall praise him and the rest of it he'll restrain. He can look through the darkness and look through the light and they're all alike unto him. His hand doeth all of these things. Now here's what some people say. Well now wait a minute now. If God gets into this area over here, predestinating sin, if he gets into this area here, now that makes God the author of sin, and therefore, they want to set up in their minds, they want to defend God. God don't need any defending. He said he spake and it was done. He does according to his will. And it happens according to his will. Who can say? Let me ask you. If you had someone like the prodigal in this community today, how would you judge him? Well, just as I thought, he had grace, but look at him now. Brother, he still had grace. And I'll tell you what. When he come back and got the robe and the ring and the shoes on, he gave a praise unto God. And after all, that's what God is aiming at. Paul said that I might be found in him. Now, he wasn't talking about being internally in him there, Gene. He was talking about in this life. He said that I might be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, but that righteousness which is of him. He said that I might, how did he say that? He said that I might be apprehended, that I, that I might apprehend that for which I was apprehended. That's what he said. He said, in other words, that I might be able to properly praise him, that I might walk in Christ, that I might live in Christ, that I might rejoice in Christ, that I might sing in Christ, that I might pray in Christ, that I might speak in Christ, that I might be in Christ, told that I might be found in him. Now, is there some that won't be found in him when he comes back? Yes. Well, you see, that's practical there. And he said, not having mine own righteousness, that's free from Moses' law. He prepares a table before us. The absolute predestination of all things. Let me hit that again. To say that God predestinated all things. I made a statement last week. I said I didn't believe in the responsibility of man. Maybe I didn't explain that enough. What I mean is, I do not believe that there's any place where the sovereignty of God runs and some say there's a fine line there and say it comes so far and then it stops and then the responsibility of man takes over. The flesh of man will never take over. 
the flesh of man cannot respond, will not respond. Jesus said, ye will not come to me that you might have life. He said that. He said, I must what? He must be drawn unto him. And so he must bring in that word draw. As old Brother Fields used to say, he said they drug them to him. Brother Fields would say they were drugged to him. Well, I think cords of love brings them to him. But what I'm saying to you is that divine sovereignty does not run like this. And then it reaches a point where God stopped and he says, now then, it's up to you to respond. I do not believe any such thing. I believe it's all covered in the divine sovereignty of God. As old Harvey Preston used to say, John, he would say, you know, boy, he looked at me and he'd say, you know what? He said it to you many a times. He said, it's all covered in God's predestination. And that little fellow knew just exactly how it was. And it's all covered in God's predestination. Every last bit of it. Things visible, invisible. Whether we see it or not, whether we know it or not, whether we understand it or not, the only real freedom that a man ever has is when he's in God's predestination. That's the only place that man can rejoice and live in. You can't live outside of it. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Paul said, I'm a bond servant of Christ. That's where freedom is. Absolute predestination. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life. He prepares a table. I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. I said, the thing that takes you to heaven is not the fact of faith. It's not faith that takes you to heaven. It's not that. It's not your repentance. It's not nothing in you. It's the fact that God loved you before the foundation of the world and put you in a place of safety. He made a choice. He made a selection and he put you there. And he prepares a table before me. You tell some people that. They say, you know what? You've got something missing upstairs. But it's true nevertheless. You mean God predestinated all things? Then what those preachers have done, so-called preachers, they've set that word hard shell up to be a bad word. They don't know what it means. It's just a bad word. Boy, that's a bad word, hard shell. That's a bad word. Well, like I said, everything that comes out of a hard shell has wings and has the ability to fly. Things come out of a soft shell, crawl on its back. <laughs> so let them say hard shell, that's all right. But that's what they've always said. If God didn't predestinate it, then it's not gonna happen. Amen, that's right, that's it. His eye sees the sparrow when it falls. I don't see it, but he does. He said, the very hairs of your head are numbered. If he numbered your hairs of your head, he numbered your days, and he numbered you. And in the elect John, he counts them among the number. If he numbers the hairs of your head, he numbers everything else. Predestination, they say, don't go only except in the late chain of salvation. It doesn't pertain out here. Brother, it pertains in every aspect of this world. God, God, he prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Knowing us my head with oil. There's a verse, let me just quote it, Isaiah 520. He said they call good evil and evil good. They call darkness light and they call light darkness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't they call they call good evil. I wouldn't believe in that doctrine of absolute predestination. I don't believe that. I don't believe in that eternal life thing. I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. They're calling good evil. And then they call evil good. Well, they see every man has a chance. God didn't predestinate all things. They just reverse it, don't they? But thou prepares a table. Notice, thou prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. My cup runneth over. Now watch what David said. He said, surely, goodness and mercy. And you know I have to say that. Goodness and mercy has followed me 
all the days of my life. From the day I was born, I see it more clearly every hour. My childhood, all through it. But I want you to notice, is that goodness and mercy that he's talking about here in David? Is it in David? Absolutely not. <laughs> he said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. He didn't say it was in David. It wasn't in David. But it was in Christ. It was in the shepherd. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. It wasn't there. It wasn't in David, but rather it was following him. That goodness is not in us. We have no goodness in ourselves. Not in this man. There's no goodness at all. And then he come down saying, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Someday, someday all of God's elect, every last one of them, shall gather in his house every elect, every elect soul, every one that he seed, even on Calvary. He said, he shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Even there he saw the seed that was with him before the foundation of the world. And he said, he'll see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. And that means, brother, he's going to see every last one of them. Can you imagine sometimes in a family gathering down here on earth? Let me make a let me make a comparison. It's not real good, but it'll do. You make a family comparison down here in this earth. When sometimes when you have a dinner on a special day and you have a dinner and all the children come in and one child is missing, you know what? That mother's heart is just as sad. That daddy's heart is sad because one child is missing. I heard a preacher say one time, or hey, well, he's not a preacher. <laughs> he said one time, he said, talking about the doctrine of election, he said, you know, he said, over in Germany, he said they was taking children away from the parents. And he said, you know, said, said they had all the children. And said they told the mother, said, now you make a choice. She had three children. Said you make a choice, uh, which one you want to keep, you know. And he said, now that's what it is. Well, that's what election is. Uh, well, let me say this: uh, they're all God's children, uh, and He made a choice of those God's children. Uh, and there will not be not one, not one shall be missing in that day when the roll is called up yonder. We'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the mind of God, we're already in it. Amen. Already in it. Amen. We're in it. God's people dwelling with Christ. David said it like this. Listen. Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. We didn't see it. We didn't know it. But we were there. Absolutely. Others have nothing to do with it. God said they're beasts. And that's what they are. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. There's a man, he'd been a friend for about 30 years. And I had the opportunity to pass a lot of this to him, but I didn't do it. Because that verse goes on to say, they'll turn and cut you and cut you with it. And I wouldn't give it to him because he'd never take it. And I didn't share a thing with him and wouldn't. Give not that which is holy to the dogs, the goats, that I should be blessed above the cattle. I'm talking about sheep. And only sheep know that. Only sheep hear that. And only sheep understand that. And only sheep can take that and enjoy that. He leads. He directs. There's not a thing in Psalm 23 about the work of a sheep. Not one earthly thing. Your very presence here this morning is because he led you here. And it was decreed for the foundation of the world that you be here. And you're here. May God bless you. Consider yourself dismissed.